keep our heart open to be who we truly are out the excuse without the facade there's no pretend Starting to fade, patient with me, lifting the veil, oh Lord, set me free. Oh Lord, set me Good morning. Hello. It is nice to see you here in the house of the Lord today. Why don't we just enter into his presence? Let's just go ahead and get our hearts and our minds in just the right mindset. If you've had a hard morning, shake it off. This is a good time to just lay it down in his presence. You've had a hard weekend. You are in the presence of Daddy God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, we love you today. We love you. We love you. Father, we ask, Lord, for your presence to be with us today. Father, may you be glorified in this place. May you be glorified. 
worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name.
is to live by faith too, Jesus. You are so, so good. Father, even when my circumstances can be so, so hard, Lord, you have been so faithful. You have been so faithful, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah.
song to him today. There is something beautiful about singing through your brokenness, about worshiping through your brokenness. There is, there is beauty and great power in that that is so honoring to the Lord.
Jesus. Church, what we've been singing about today is really the basis of our relationship with God. One, knowing God is good. Your prayers to God, your relationship with God is different if you believe God is good. There's many people believe that God is out to get them, that God failed them, that God did something wrong, something bad. But the reality is, is God is good. And so your relationship with him starts right there. We judge God based upon things sometimes that come into our life, uh, negative things, troubling things. And if you judge God based upon the ever-changing events that take place in your life, then you're not really looking at him as the never-changing God who is always good. Make sense? So God is good is really a basis of our relationship with him. Secondly, we, we spoke about, we're saying about God is holy. While the word holy uh, certainly talks about the purity of God, it also talks about the fact that God is one and only up and above all. He is holy. If you believe that, it changes your relationship with God and it changes your thoughts towards God. If you know that God is good and you know that God is holy, then you and I become thankful. Now, he doesn't say to be thankful for everything that comes into our life, but he says in the midst of everything, be, th be thankful. Why? Because our thankfulness changes our relationship with God. In a time period of history when things are getting difficult, fearful, We need to know that God is good. We need to go know that God is holy. And we need to be thankful. Because He's going to carry us through this. And, th and He through us, His light is going to shine through us. Do you believe that today? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Let's take a moment of prayer for anyone that needs prayer today before we move along. If you need prayer for anything today, prayer for healing or something in your life right now, uh, just lift your hand if you would. Just lift your hand right now, anywhere in the room, right down here. Thank you, Faith. Right back over here. Um, where else today? I'm looking around over here. Um, if you'd keep those hands up just for a moment. Uh, I think I see a lot of ladies having their hands raised up. So can I have a team of ladies right now go to them? Um, if you would, please keep your hand up and just let someone come. And they're going to join together with you in prayer, whatever those needs are. Thank you, Jesus. The rest of us, just be an attitude of prayer right now towards any of those that are being prayed for. For God's help, God's provision, God's answer, whatever it may be that they have need of today. And we're going to join together with those of you that are online right now as well. We've not forgotten you because there's many today that are joining us online. Uh, it's a lifeline for many that uh, cannot at this point get out, cannot... Uh, do that and so we join together in prayer right now can let's make an attitude of prayer all throughout the sanctuary today if you would please father we just pray for these whose hands are up we pray for these who are online right now lord who are watching listening and saying i have a need lord even that as their hand goes up yes lord i have a need 
Lord, you see that hand. It could be in this sanctuary. It could be anywhere in this vicinity around us today. And it could be in various parts of the world. Lord, we proclaim your word is true. We proclaim you are holy and you are sovereign God. And you are mighty and you are powerful. And Lord, your love and your kindness, mercy reaches out to each and every one today. And you take care of your people. We can trust in you. You're trustworthy. Thank you for showing that today, Lord. Bring strength to those who need it today. Bring healing to those who need it today. Lord, I'm glad that last week we prayed for that, or maybe it's the week before. But Lord, even someone was watching, was healed, even as we spoke it. Thank you, Lord, today for that. And may others have the touch of God upon their life. Lord, I thank you right now. Bless these, I pray, with your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and receive our tithes and offerings. And uh, those of you that are still in little circles of prayer, once you're finished, We'll do that as well. So, um, Father, we just ask your blessing upon that which is given. Give us wisdom in being good stewards of that which is given. Lord, we thank you for meeting all the needs as you've been so faithful to do over the years. We ask your blessing upon your people as they give. As you say, Lord, you will give back to them a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Let it be poured back into them, Lord, we pray. We give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today as you bring tithes and offerings unto the Lord right up here. Thank you today. Worship him for who he is. Who is he? I am. 
He's got a lot of other titles that go with that, but he is I am, not I was or I could be sometime. I am presently with you. I am good. I am faithful. I'm just. And it is that one that we are here to worship today, to draw close to, to hear, and to be able to share in his presence together. It is good to be here with you guys this morning. Um, those of you who are joining with us online, it's good to have you here with us too. Thank you for joining in with us this morning. Just a few things uh, before we get started. If you're here with us in the house today, you're going to see in the seat that's just in front of you a welcome card. And if you are new here with us today, uh, we would ask that you'd fill out that welcome card, take it out uh, to the foyer there. We've got or we've got ushers who uh, would like to take that card and be able to get you connected with a gift that we have for you is our way of saying thank you for joining our family here at Delphi First Assembly. Would you give those who are new with us a round of applause, please? If you're joining with us online today, uh, we don't have anything for you online as, as a gift, um, but if you would let us know if you are new, if it's uh, your first time joining with us, it's, a, it's always a blessing to be able to have you uh, joining in with us here and taking a part in the Lord's presence. Just a few things here before we get started this morning with the word. Ablaze Youth Ministry is holding a chili cook-off and dessert auction today. You may have noticed that the teens are suspiciously absent this morning and promise that everything's okay. They're all over getting ready to serve you chili this, the, today after church and be able to, uh, to take part in that. So we're looking forward to being able to share in that with you. Please make plans to be able to join us after service this morning for lunch uh, with chili cook-off. If you're online, you weren't able to make it in this morning for some reason, that's okay. We still want to extend the invitation if you want to join us with, for the chili cook-off today. If you're able to, please feel free to, to come and, uh, and take part in that with us. Women's ministry, you'll be having a bonfire out at Abbey Boyd's on Friday, October 2nd. Friday, October 2nd. Save the date. There are more details to come. Uh, for rooted classes, we've been talking about, we've got the Living by the Book class that we have registrations open for at this time. Registrations will be closing September 30th. So this is the last Sunday for you to be able to register for the Living by the Book rooted group course on Wednesdays. Um, please see the table out for more information or you can, you can ask me. Uh, home groups. It is not too late to join a home group. We do have five different home groups that are meeting right now. And if you have not gotten involved in one year and you're thinking, ah, you know, Pastor Brett, I, I haven't really gotten to know very many people in church. I, I know some faces and some people who I, if I could, I could pick them out of the lineup and if they ask, people ask me who goes to church here, but I don't know people's names or really what their story is or what God's doing in their life. Home group is a great way to connect with people. Not the only way by, by far, but certainly one of the, the easiest ways and one of the ways that we are embracing as a church to being able to connect with people, get to know them, and be able to grow in, in our walk with the Lord together. So uh, we have flyers about for more information, or uh, if you're online, you can, uh, you can either look on the website or you can contact us at the church office. Uh, finally, a Blaze Youth Group. There are several activities that a Blaze Youth Group has coming up soon. One of them is going to be serving at the Lafayette Urban Ministry Shelter. Uh, they're also doing activities at Exploration Acres, and they have a fall retreat coming up. Um, youth Group is going to be meeting tonight at 6 p.m. for more information on upcoming events, for things that are going on with the teens, and how you can get involved. If you have a student or you're thinking, man, you know what, the Lord's been pressing into me to get involved and serve somewhere, and I don't really know what, what to do. Well, the teens are all over in the youth chapel right now, getting ready for a chili cook-off, like we said. But if you're feeling, if you're feeling a call to serve, if you're feeling maybe, or you're a student who's who uh, who's here this morning, we do have youth group coming up at 6 p.m. tonight. For more, uh, please be able to please uh, ask Mike and Rachel Roberts for more information on that. And without any further ado, Pastor Brent. Well, good morning. 
Sorry that uh, I could not be here last week. I was where I was supposed to be. Uh, as most of you probably know by now, um, 2.05 a.m. Monday morning, uh, Tammy's mom went to be with the Lord. And uh, she, on Friday, uh, a week ago, was out pulling weeds uh, in her yard and uh, stuff. And she loved to garden, uh, loved to do things like that, loved to be outside, loved flowers, loved color. And she was out doing that, went inside the house. And uh, Tammy's brother, Dale, who lives right behind her, walked over and sat down and started talking to her. When she started talking back, Dale said she just made no sense whatsoever. And he knew something wasn't right. And so ended up took her to the hospital uh, she was bleeding in the in the brain area, and uh, they lifelined her to Indianapolis. And uh, not too long after being there, the doctor come out with the word that this is not survivable. And so that was Saturday morning. Uh, so we spent Saturday morning. Tammy spent all night Saturday night uh, there with her, and all night Sunday night there with her. Um, I had gotten a hotel Saturday night. Uh, went over and, and was with Tammy on Sunday morning. And um, I knew that's where I was supposed to be and not here. And uh, I think you'd all agree with that. Uh, so I had gotten a hotel Saturday night. And uh, my brother-in-law, he and I uh, shared a room together. And then uh, Tammy was up all night um, with her mom. Things were somewhat stable on Sunday morning. So she come back. I asked her if she wanted to come back to the hotel and at least get a little sleep and take a shower on Sunday morning. She did. And while she was doing that, uh, to leave her alone and let her sleep, I went out in the van and spent the next two to three hours watching online services, including this one. All right. So I was with you last week. I uh, appreciate Pastor Brett um, at the last moment pitch hitting for me. Um, as we saw things going on on Saturday morning, uh, I, I messaged him or actually emailed him and I said, here's a copy of my notes for Sunday. And uh, I said, uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, but you have them just in case. And uh, the just in case came about and so uh, the team here certainly carried on and I'm thankful to have people that can carry right along and the presence of God is here, the Word of God is preached, people have opportunity to be ministered to and all of that. Amen? And so, Pastor Brett, thanks for being ready to go. He actually was in uh, Indiana School of Ministry that day, and so he spent all day there probably half thinking about what the class was about and half thinking about, oh, God, help me, i got to preach in the morning, and I don't know, <laughs> am I right? Kind of... Uh, all of that going on, a little distracted maybe, but uh, appreciate all of that. So Tammy is with us today, and not, again, not knowing all what was taking place. Uh, the visitation for the funeral was Friday night. The funeral was yesterday. Uh, we had it all at Southview Church, where I've been preaching as well on Sunday nights. And uh, the team over there uh, just did an incredible job of serving uh, as we had the funeral at the church, as soon as the funeral was over, we went out to the cemetery, and from the cemetery, we went right back to the church, and they had changed everything around, brought in tables, and served a meal to between 55 and 60 people, I believe, uh, on Saturday, and they just did an incredible job of ministering to our family uh, by serving a meal, and just uh, the accommodations and everything were wonderful. So it's our sister congregation. Okay, so amen. Anybody ready for the Word of God? Let me encourage you as we get into the Word today, um, as this very vital time that we live in, this very difficult time that we live in, uh, the Bible indicates many things to us. And I tr keep trying to remind you of these things. As Paul is writing to Timothy to remind Timothy of things, I, I speak to you to remind you of things that we live in very difficult times. 
And uh, in some ways, we're probably going to see an escalation of those difficulties. I don't say that to discourage you. I don't say that to bring you fear. I say that so that you're not thrown off track, that what comes you expect. But I also say that because it's during this time you should also expect the presence of God, the power of God at work as well. We as believers, there's a difference. We're not left alone. Church, we're not left alone. We rely upon the presence of God. We rely upon the promises of God. We are different because we're not left alone. We have a power that's beyond ourselves. We have to rely upon that. The other thing the Bible tells us is in these last days, it says that um, it really depicts the uh, book of Revelation, which talks about the church of Laodicea becoming a lukewarm church. And here's what I want to encourage you in. Don't allow that to happen. Don't allow that to happen. When Jesus says in Matthew, because of the increase of wickedness or lawlessness, the love of most will grow cold. There's going to be a lukewarmness take place. You have to work at it. You have to be diligent. You have to be focused to stay hot on fire for God. You have to feed your spirit. Come on. Come on. Hello. You have to be diligent to keep the fire of God. God is big enough to keep you But we have a responsibility also. And let me encourage you, don't slack off. Don't get distracted. This is the hour for the church, empowered by the Spirit of God, to be the light of Jesus in this world. Amen? All right. So as Paul's writing to Timothy... And Paul continues, once again, Paul being the, the uh, elder statesman, his mentor, his mentor. Paul is writing to Timothy. Paul writing from jail, knowing he's about to be um, martyred, killed for his faith. He writes to this young man who is uh, pastoring a church in very difficult times. The church is dwindling, kind of like you see the church in America. If you look around, and I know we have a number of people over there preparing for uh, the chili dinner and everything else, but the reality is the number of people that were here in this church before COVID-19, about 30% have not come back. And some uh, ministers, some authors are saying, and there's going to be a significant percentage that will not ever come back. And it's part of those who are falling away. They got in the habit of being separated. They're like logs on a fire and someone threw the log over there. It's not around the other ones, so it doesn't continue to have the heat of the others. And it goes over there, begins to smolder, and then just begins to go out. Because we need each other. As much as we need God, we need His Word, we need His Spirit, we need each other. And so these things are vital. As we're talking about home groups, I know, you know... I, I try to be clear when I speak. I'm not trying to be criticizing. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to be anything else. But I'm just saying, we talk about home groups, and some of you in this room, no matter how many times we talk about home groups, you won't go. You've made your decision. It doesn't matter what we say. And all I want to say to you is this. Why are we doing this? First and foremost, it is the biblical model. In the New Testament church, book of Acts, you will note they met at the temple and from house to house. It was both and, not either or. Why did they do that? Because that's the pattern that the Lord set up for the maximizing of the making of disciples to do the work of God. 
And so I just want to continue to urge you, as Pastor Brett is as well, that home groups give an opportunity for you to meet other Christians, for the logs that are on blaze, ablaze with the fire of God to get together and create a bigger blaze. And without that, it makes it much more difficult. And you, you don't need it more difficult for you. Right? Some people say, you know, it's really difficult in this day. Yes. So do everything that you can to make sure that you have everything that you need. This is a pastor like a father who's urging his kids, I know what's best. And I know what's best for you because I trust in the word of God and what it says and how it leads us. So let me urge you into that. Second Timothy chapter three, starting in verse one. If you have a way to take notes, I'm going to give you today the 19 characteristics that the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, 19 characteristics of the last days. Here's what's going to be happening. Here's what people are going to be like. 19 different things. And once, I, you, you know, um, knowing that there's 19, it's like, okay, Brent, you've got to really be on this here because this could take a little bit. And so 19, so here we go. He says, but mark this. Mark this. Take note. Be aware. Know this. That there will be terrible times in the last days. That word terrible times mean fierce times, grievous times, times that will reduce the strength of people. It will sap the strength right out of you, the times that we're, that we're going to be in. And he says there will be terrible times in the last days. The word last days there literally means the final days, the farthest, the latter end. Paul knew that according to the Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, in the Bible, in Acts chapter 2, he says that when the Holy Spirit was poured out, this is that which the uh, prophet Joel spoke, that in the last days God says, I will pour out my Spirit. So we know that Paul knew they were living in the last days, but this word right here tends to look toward the latest, the last of the last days. So the last days has been almost 2,000 years long, and we are now in the last of the last days. So here's what's going to happen. And, and I want to bring in one other scripture before I go on to the 19, uh, one other scripture and, and a, a current event. Paul had told Timothy in 1 Timothy, so the, the letter he wrote to him before, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Folks, there are people speaking today. They may be Christians. They may not be Christians. But there are people speaking today that actually are being influenced by demonic spirits and they are speaking lies as if they're truths. They're speaking lies as if they're truths. You should not be surprised and I'm not being judgmental. The word of God says it's going to happen. In the latter times, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. People saying things that are the opposite of what is really the truth. In verse 2, he says, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Hypocrisy leads me to believe deep down they know better, but they're being hypocrites and just saying it because they want to, because they have an ulterior motive. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. When something is seared with a hot iron, it becomes desensitized to anything. People that can speak lives hypocritically and they don't even feel bad about it. In fact, I, I've heard people doing this and I look at them and I go, can you really believe what you're saying? What you're saying is the total opposite of what's true. And you're saying it with a straight face like you believe it. And they do. 
because they're desensitized. Just what Paul told Timothy, and he told it is going to happen in the last days, the latter times, and it is happening. Why am I telling you this? Because this right here is deceiving people. It's deceiving people. How do you know what is really true and what's not? Well, they say that if you speak a lie enough times, people will believe it to be the truth. And so you end up and hear lie after lie after lie, which is spoken of as truth, and sooner or later, people will believe that it is true. You've got to look at the spirit behind what's going on. If it's a spirit that comes to steal or kill or destroy, tear down, all of that, you know it's coming from Satan. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so if the activities or if the words of someone are to steal, kill, or destroy, all of that, you know, no matter how nice they look, no matter how much they smile, no matter how much they think they're right, they're lying. And so too many Christians are too gullible and need to know the spirit behind what's going on. Partly is we need to know the word of God so we know God's truth and we can compare what's going on with God's truth. Listen, for we as followers of Christ, this book right here needs to be the guiding light of everything that we think, we know, we, we look at, we try to discern what's right. It's a, it comes back to this book. So I read an article yesterday, an attorney, 40-some-year-old attorney named Jamie Smith, says she was fearful after Ju Ju Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death and says the death of this justice pushed me to join the Satanic Temple. In the hours after, she says, in the hours after Justice Ginsburg's death, I sat wondering what the future would hold for my daughters. Their ability to live in a country where the religious beliefs of others would not play a role in their right to assert autonomy over their own bodies was suddenly starkly in danger. She is so fearful that her daughters won't be able to choose to get an abortion if they want to because one of the chief one of the justices who was a champion of abortion rights died and the fear that the president would would nominate someone that would not be a champion of abortion rights caused her to join the satanic temple <laughs> are you looking at me like going seriously does this make any sense? But that is the delusion that this country is under. It, it, is a, it is a demonic attack on our country. And, and let me just put it to you this way. That, uh, to me, this, this is what makes sense. Okay, we have God who is holy above all. You have the angelic beings, then we have people, right? Okay, so humanity is under the angels and demons until we're saved. Once we're born again and the Spirit of God lives inside of us, then we now have power over the demonic realm. But until we're saved, until we're born again and living for Jesus, the demonic realm has power over us. And we are nothing more than puppets on a string. The demons pull our string and we do what we do. There's an influence there that's too strong to resist. And so what you have going on in our country is a whole host of people who are not followers of Jesus Christ who are being influenced by demonic spirits and they're pulling the strings. And some people say, you see, I'll, put, I'll just tell you the truth. Am I a conspiracy theorist? Absolutely yes. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says that Satan has schemes. The schemes of the devil, right? 
And so do I think there's some underlying scheme working around trying to do this and trying to do that? People say, oh, you, you guys, you're always thinking somebody's out to, you know, do something that's some deep state thing or whatever. You're just nuts. There is a deep state, but it's a demonic state. And the schemes of the devil are working through those whom they can influence to do what they do. So the only way for us to combat that is that God rises up, the Spirit of God and the angelic realm rises up and overcomes all of this. Our power is in the Spirit of God. Amen? So let's go on. He says, and we're ready for the 19. I got to get moving. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you ready? You've been ready a long time, haven't you? All right, here we go. He says, people be lovers of themselves. Always want, uh, uh, what's best for me? Putting myself before God. I judge everything based upon how it matters to me. He says, people be lovers of their own selves. Secondly, see how fast I can go. Lovers of money. Always want more. So I can have more. Not content with what I have. And a scripture that goes with that is First Timothy chapter one verses, in fact, chapter six verses nine and ten. Next, about last one, please. I didn't get to that yet. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation, and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Next one now, yeah. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. He's not saying that money is evil. Say money's not evil. Money's not evil. Wealth is not evil. Having things is not evil. The love of money. It is when I love it and I have to have it and I have to have more and that's my focus and that's my desire. That's where it leads into all the other things. Okay. So um, I've gone to one and one and two. I got a couple other scriptures here, but I want to. I want to. <laughs> sorry, I want to back up. Because I want, to, I want to remind you of the contrast here. And rather than do it at the end, I want to do it all the way through. So, if we're to be the people of God, we're going to be the opposite of these 19 things. Okay? So rather than love ourselves, we're going to love God and others. So when you find yourself, everything starts to look internal, you know you're on the wrong side. Loving God and loving others, even loving God and loving others more than yourself is where we need to be as a, as a follower of Christ. All right? So in lovers of money, if, if we're always wanting more, never, never enough, never enough, it's another thing if, if what God blesses us with, we're able to use for our provisions, but then if God blesses us with abundance, then we need to be generous. So the contrast of this is being a generous people. The, the, the world should see among his, the followers of Christ generosity among us. We should be the givers. Right? It's a character of Christ and it's combating this whole thing. In Ephesians 5.3, Paul said to that church, but among you there must not be a hint even a hint of sexual morality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. Greed. Want more, want more, want more, want more. There should not be a hint of that among God's people. Number three, boastful. A person who boasts in what he has, talks about who he is, what he has, etc. Someone who, once again, whose eyes on themselves and they're boasting. In James 4.16, it says, boast, when you're boasting about your own plans, all such boasting is evil. Why? Because boasting is, oh, boasting puts me at the focus and makes me think I'm in charge. It depicts that I'm in charge. So what's the opposite of that? Boasting in the Lord. Look what the Lord has done. The Lord has allowed. The Lord did this. The Lord did that, boasting about what other people have done and what a blessing that they are, but not boasting about me. Okay? Number four, proud. Putting ourselves above others. 
comparing ourselves with others and believing that we are above. Pride, the Bible says, goes before a downfall. Pride, according to Andrew Murray, is the soil. Pride is the soil out of which everything negative grows. And again, pride looks to me. The opposite of that, obviously, is humility. Again, it is living for the benefit of God and others and not for the benefit of myself. Five, blasphemers. I think one version says abusers. This is uh, cursing or insults against God or man. It comes from a disturbed or a dissatisfied heart. Um, in Psalm ten seven, it says, The wicked man's mouth is full of curses and lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. Church, we, we see that in the streets of America today. People who are cursing one another and cursing God. Holding up signs, cursing one another and cursing God. This is nothing more than influence from the demonic realm. And we're to be people that don't do that. We speak blessing, not cursing. We lift up, not tear down. Okay? Number six. Disobedient to parents. And the youth are all next door. <laughs> Rebelling. Refusing to do what a parent says. Disrespect. Dishonor. It is one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It is the commandment that comes with a promise. Being And so disobedience is undermining authority. And God placed that authority there. Parents are from God. And to rebel against parent is to rebel against God. And I know today that teenagers empower teenagers to be rebellious. Okay? It's not right. It's never right. He says not to be disobedient, but to be obedient. Honor father and mother. Proverbs thirty seventeen. This is kind of graphic. The eye that mocks a father and despises a mother's instructions will be plucked out by ravens of the valley and eaten by vultures. That's pretty graphic, isn't it? And I would say that uh, while there could have been somewhere along the line some literal truth to that, and there's certainly figurative truth to that. 1 Timothy 5.4 it says, if a widow has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God. Would you please make sure that my kids get this DVD? I'm counting on that. Dustin's in the room. Cassie's in the room. I'm safe. Shall I repeat that one more time? You, you got it? <laughs> Number seven, ungrateful. Feelings that people, society owe me, my rights, leads to wrong thought, wrong opinion, wrong understanding. Being ungrateful. And today, that is a huge thing going on. Of all the freedoms in this country, of all the ability to be whatever in this country, the ungratefulness that is through this country is amazing. Are there, is, are there things that are wrong in this country? Well, absolutely. Are there things that are unfair in this country? Absolutely. But ungratefulness abounds, and this creates a problem. So what should the God's people be? Grateful, thankful, thankful, thankful. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. 
And the next part says they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. I want you to notice this very clearly. The moment that Satan tempts you to be unthankful to God because something is not right in your life, okay, or something's difficult, notice that the lack of worship for God and the lack of thanksgiving to God leads people to foolish ideas of what God was like and the, and minds become dark and confused. Well, I just don't even know what's right anymore. Well, I just don't even know if there's a God anymore. Why do people come to that place? The lack of worship of God, the lack of thankfulness to God. Their foolish minds become darkened. There's not one of us in this room that that couldn't happen to. So we need to remain thankful. When you find yourself starting to gripe, stop it. Number eight, unholy means impure, sinful, profane, indecent, shameless, not set apart. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So obviously it tells us we should be holy. Because unholy is going to be a mark of the last days. We're called to be holy. And part of that holiness is set apart. You don't want to fit in and look like those who are not followers of Christ. You're called to be holy. Number nine, without love. This word love here, there's several words in the Greek that speak of love. This word love here is, is not phileo love. It is not eros love. It is not agape love. It's actually called stergo. The Greek word stergo. And in that, it means a natural affection, such as a love for family or love for friends. It is a natural type of friendship and love one toward another. The, it says it's, it's going to be, and again, you're seeing this played out in the cities and streets of, of our country right now. People that, uh, they, they just walk by and they hate you just because they hate you. The natural affection you know, <laughs> it, it, I don't know why this, this catches me funny, but um, sometimes I walk by people and and maybe they acknowledge me or maybe they don't acknowledge me. And as I'm getting past them, I go, hello, fellow human. <laughs> I don't I don't actually I, I haven't said it loud enough that they probably heard me. <laughs> but. I think the point of the matter is this. I don't care if you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, this, that. It doesn't matter to me. A fellow human being, there's a natural affection. You're part of the human race, and there should be a natural affection. You know, there should never be a, a hatred. Just be, I don't even know you. I don't know anything about you, but I hate you because of this or this or this or this. That's just dumb. And it's definitely not godly. And so we in the church should be the people that can walk by, hello, fellow human. You don't know their name. You don't know anything about them. But there's a natural affection. I mean, in a right way, there's a natural affection because they're a part of the human race and they're people that God loves. And if God loves them, then we're supposed to also. This is the way that we show the difference in this world. Number 10, truce breakers. People that are untrustworthy, people that break promises, people that do not keep their word. And, and you will note that in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus said in the last days that, once again, because of the increase of wickedness and lawlessness, uh, people will hate and betray. There will be, uh, you know, a, a truce breaker is, is someone who has some sort of a uh, whether you want to say a, a business dealing or, or a marriage or, or a, a parent-child relationship or whatever it is, or you just give someone your word about something, your word should mean something. We should not be truce breakers. Number 11, slanderous. The word slanderous there is actually the Greek word diabolos. Diabolos. <laughs> means false accuser. 
We see it in family. We see it in government. We see people who are speaking evil about other people. I was pretty amazed of the people that were already slandering the president's nomination for the Supreme Court, and they didn't even know who it was, it was yet. Okay, but what, here's, here's what we need to understand. There's a spirit behind that. And that spirit is just totally out of control. It seeks to slander, just like what happened with Brett Kavanaugh. It seeks to slander, drum up, just, just like some of the people did against Jesus where they brought in false accusers and, and said false things about him. It's exactly what we see happening today. And again, the Bible's told us the way that it's going to be. So we need to be people that speak truth about people. And... and if truth is going to tear them down, we probably should refrain from even speaking that. Right? So this list tells us what not to be, but let's be reminded of what we are to be. So not slanderous, speaking well. Number 12, without self-control. Cannot control desire, desire for pleasure, indulgence. Could be food, could be sexual. Without self-control. In Romans chapter 6 verse 12 it says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Self-control is a big thing. The Nike commercial, if it feels good, do it. If it's pleasurable, people feel like, I have to. I can't help myself. You may not be able to help yourself, but the Holy Spirit within you is able to give you the strength to control the temptations of evil desires and things that bring you destruction. You can't do it. You yielding to the power of the Spirit of God in you can do it. And when we think that we can do things ourselves... We'll prove to ourselves real quickly we're wrong. Right? So, to be able to exercise self-control means a yieldedness to the Spirit of God. Calling out to God. God, I need your help. I can't do this. Yesterday, Tammy told a story about her mom. Who's, who's in the room has been married 50 years or more? You guys? Anyone else? 50 years or more? How many years? 51. <laughs> That's more. <laughs> 50 years or more. Tammy's mom and dad were married about 69 and a half years. You guys are just kids. <laughs> anyway, it's good to see you here, Jane. Um, what happens when you're married 69 and a half years and all of a sudden he's not there? And Tammy's mom said, because we, we, we didn't know what was going to happen. And it's like, she said, well, it, mom, I mean, Tammy said, you know, mom, you're just, you're doing great. <laughs> you know, um, we didn't know if this grief would just totally overcome you or what. And she said, I prayed and asked God for the comforter. And he came. Come on, church, that's real faith. That's real faith, to know your lack, to know your weakness, to know your deficiencies, to know what you can't do, to know what you can't control, to know what you can't handle. And you cry out to God, and He is faithful. Amen? So if you can't exercise self-control, call upon the Spirit of God for strength, and He will give it to you if you will yield to Him. 13, brutal, means fierce, savage. Remember, in that day, in Timothy's day, um, how brutal things were. Again, Nero and others who had it against Christians. They were burning Christians at the stake. There was, there, they were beheading Christians. It was brutal. It was fierce. It was demonic. 
And I say it again, and, and I think probably this election coming up, if there's any day, and, and, and the politicians are setting the uh, stage for what this election is about. Um, and I've had conversations with people, and I said, to me, uh, there's, there's, there's many issues, but there are two supreme issues that come to my mind immediately. And one is abortion, and the, number two is Israel. You know, the Bible says, the promise to Abraham, which goes down to all generations, I will bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you. And so when we become people who bless Israel, um, then, then that puts us in the right position with God. And uh, abortion being the other issue. And again, it's highly likely there's people in this room who have had abortion. Uh, it, and someone was, uh, I had a guy tell me the other day, Pastor, what concerns me is, is I paid for one. So it's, it's both men and women. And, and all of us are eternally grateful for the grace and mercy of God through repentance. We can, we can be forgiven of something that we did at one point in our life. And we're very grateful for all of that. And I always want to mention that. But at the same time, you can't back away from saying, if God gives justice to a country that kills over six million, 60 million babies, we're in trouble. Amen? I was reading a thing the other day, and it really blew me away because I, I, I just didn't know. I'm honest, I didn't know. From the time in America, for the last 40 years, how many abortions have taken place worldwide? You think 60 million in America, so how many more? Are you ready for this number? Two billion. In the last 40 years. The fact that God has held back and not judged for that. There is no age that is more fierce, brutal than this age. And to have done that to the most innocent. It's no wonder yesterday... Thousands upon thousands of people gathered in Washington, D.C. for a whole day of prayer, repentance, calling upon God for help and mercy. Brutal. So obviously, what are we supposed to be? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, not seeking to hurt, not brutal, not fierce but kind-hearted, tender-hearted. Number 14. The mark of the age, people will not be lovers of good. They'll want nothing to do with that which is good. Want to party, want to indulge, want to look, feel, taste, experience, possess, take, fit in, be acceptable with the crowd. They'll let morality and justice go and reject whatever restraint they may feel that actually despise righteousness and want nothing to do with anyone who speaks up for what is right why because deep down they don't believe god is good what what's happening in our society is the exaltation of humanity over god we know more we're in charge not some figment of your imagination that you call God is how it comes across. So obviously, what does it say for us? We should be lovers of good. We should promote good. We should speak good. We, sh we should look for good. We should want good. And if someone says about you, oh, you know, you're just some goody goody. Hallelujah. You say, thank you so much for saying that. God tells us to love the good. And the fact that you think that that's where I'm at makes me happy. Thank you for doing that. Traitors. People who betray, turn their back on God, the church, friends. Mark 13, 12, brother will betray brother to death and a father, his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have to put them to death.
we're seeing it today. When we started doing Royal Family Kids Camp in uh, 16 years ago, um, I don't know that there were any children in Carroll County at that point that were part of the camp because there were no 7 to 11-year-olds in foster care. Now there are the last, if I remember right, um, was it 40 or more, Tammy? Do you remember? At least 40 or more cases right now, children in foster care just in Carroll County. And it might even be higher than that. And someone that's in foster care obviously is because of neglect or abuse or something. It is people who have turned their back and not have natural affection, a parent to a child, because parents are so self-consumed, they don't really care. Got to smoke my weed, got to do this, got to do that, let the child just lay over there for hours till the child cries enough that I have to do something. You know, such a selfish child. Why can't they just grow up? I'm telling you, that's the attitude of some parents today. You're going, how? It's the age we live. How much more do we need to be nurturing toward others? Number 16, rash. Not having a rash, being rash. <laughs> living with, which is living without thought of consequences. Living for the moment. Don't care about myself or anyone else, just rash. Number 16, well, so, so for us, it, we need to be the opposite. We do live with thought of what consequences are for what we do. We don't just live for the moment, not live for just the pleasure of the moment. We actually have plans and we seek God and, and we're going somewhere, not just living for the moment. Conceited, verse number, number 17, conceited. I think one word in one version says high-minded. Feelings of self-importance and don't care about others. In Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider other better than yourselves. Always look into others. Always look into others. And we could all say, well, what about me? Can I say this to you? I will. <laughs> if, if we look to God and look to be a blessing to others, something tells me God will make sure we're taken care of. And that's how that is comes back to our trust of God. Our trust of God is that if I do what's right and I'm a blessing to others. That God will take care of me. Number 18, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Living to please myself. I love God for what he does for me. But if God doesn't give me what I want, then I don't love God. People who don't want to sacrifice, they don't want to suffer. Okay, I don't want to suffer either. But if it comes to I'm called to suffer, I have to say yes. Isn't that right? That's Christianity. It's not always fun and games. It's greatly joyful. So we make sure that we're lovers of God more than lovers of pleasure. You understand that to some Christians, more than one hour in church is way too long. But the three and a half hour football game is just fine. And is it possible that with COVID... God began to jerk out our gods from under us. Sports gone, entertainment gone, health care failing us. All the things that we have trusted in, all the things that we've wanted, all the things that we've given everything to, it's just not there. What are we going to do? How are we going to live? God says, pick me, pick me. Number 19. I told you would make it. 
I have such doubters up there in the upper room. May the Spirit of the Lord fall upon you. (laughs) Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. A powerless religion. A belief or life that contradicts the belief in the power. And this word there, denying a power, is the word dunamis, which is exactly the word that Jesus used when he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. So what he's really saying is, a form of godliness, but denying the Holy Spirit and the, and the power that comes with and through the Holy Spirit. His ability, miracle work, the miracle workings of God. Religionists will deny the power of the cross, the power of the blood, the power of the Spirit, the power of the Word to save, heal, and deliver. And we should be the kind of people that we believe in all of that. And then he says, oh, the people who have... A form of godliness, deny his power. Here's what you do. Have nothing to do with him. That's not your closest friends. Because what's going to happen is, is they're going to drag you down. They're not going to speak faith into your life. They're not going to speak belief. They're not going to hold you accountable to actions. And it's just one more way of saying, if I'm going to avoid the people that that would drag me down the and, and this is people who even call themselves christians but deny the power of god and i don't think that what he's saying here means that you can't ever talk to them he's saying that's not your closest acquaintances you've got to be tightly fitted together with people of faith I'm going to read verses 6 through 9. They are the kind, the people who deny the power of God, they are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down by sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires. I find this interesting because there again, the early church went to the temple and house to house. And so he's saying here they worm their way into homes. This is a warning for our home group leaders. You're in the leadership, and you need to exercise appropriate authority of that leadership. And if there are those that come in that try to turn the tables or to bring in doubt and unbelief and and cast doubt on the Word of God and all of that stuff, you can't allow that to continue. If you want to put this in a modern context... I think it was in the homes back then. But in a modern context, I'm not so sure that some of this comes via the TV, via the Internet, via social media. People who, through those means, worm their way into your home with a screen right in front of you and speak things that are not, or that speaks things that are contrary to the Word of God. And if you get at a place to where you are vulnerable, maybe COVID-19 hit and you're by yourself for the next 10 weeks and you're vulnerable and all of a sudden you begin to believe some things because you've been separated from people long enough that you're not standing strong. And the enemy of your soul, the devil knows that you are vulnerable and he will make sure that things come by your ears and your eyes to try to sway you and turn you off in a different direction. Verse 7, always learning but never able to understand or acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men opposed truth. Men of depraved minds who, as far as faith is concerned, are rejected. There's evidence in the Old Testament to where this was, this was a, a, a battle between uh, the people of God and imposters. And, and they would do dark magical arts and other things. Believe me, there is, and some people call this a Jezebel spirit. And, of course, that's because Jezebel was a woman, everybody thinks women. But Jezebel spirit could be when men or women. But it is, a, it is a demonic spirit that tries to intimidate people and control. Right? Has anyone seen any news things? Say her name. 
people coming up in people's faces. Say this. Say this. Intimidation. It's a demonic spirit. It's a Jezebel spirit. And it can be broken by the people of God through prayer and not yielding to it. If we are intimidated and let fear control us, then the devil wins. So we can't do that. So that's what this scripture is speaking of here. And then he goes, but they will, verse 9, they will not, is it verse 9, right? But they will not get very far because as in their case, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. What do we mean by that? Every time I see in the scripture where you had a battle between the forces of evil and the forces of God, the forces of God win. Gideon's army of 300 outmanned amazingly wins. Come on. The prophets of Baal, the God who answers by fire, let him be God. God shows himself. Church, I want you to get ready for this. I've talked about the kinds of days we live in, and it's dark and it's ugly. But this is the day the light is going to shine. And so I share this with you not to make you discouraged, let you walk out and feel like all hope is lost. All hope is not lost because Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is interceding for us. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be with us to the very end. Okay? And so don't let the darkness of the world, which the Bible says will cause the love of most to grow cold, don't let the darkness of the world do that to you. This is the hour that God is going to shine through his people that will continue their faith in him, and that's you and I. I want you to believe that, but even more so, I want you to believe it. I want you to pursue God diligently that you are a part of that. If you think that comes by just walking into Delphi First Assembly on a Sunday morning and you're going to be one of those empowered by the Spirit of God in these days, but Monday through Saturday you don't do anything about that, you're wrong. Come on, guys. I care about you. I want you to see this. I believe that the Spirit of God is in you to empower you for these days to bring glory to the Lord. So let me close with this. Yesterday, thousands of people gathered in Washington, D.C. That's a picture of yesterday. To pray. Organized by many Christian leaders around the nation, including Jonathan Kahn, Reverend Franklin Graham, and others, called the return. It was a day of prayer and repentance on the National Mall, live streamed throughout the land. As Jonathan Kahn put it, we drove God out of our hearts, out of our government, out of our ways, out of laws, out of the education of our children, out of the public squares, out of our businesses, out of our media, out of our culture, and out of our lives. And as we drove him out, we opened up a vacuum into which came a flood of other gods. How do we stop this downward spiral? To repent and return and appeal to the one true God. And that's what, that's what yesterday was about. It was live streamed pretty much all day long. If you didn't see it, I believe that you could still go back and watch what was there. Uh, many inspiring people there. And most of it, most of it people praying. Um, to the, I didn't see all of it. I probably didn't even see most of it. I saw a little bit of it. And what I saw was this. People coming up, say a couple words, leading in prayer. Someone up, leading in prayer. And it was prayer all through the day. Prayer of repentance. Um, several things. Very inspiring. What happens when people gather together and repent and cry out to God? What happens? We have to believe that God will hear. It's encouraging. 
according to Am Graham Lotz, who was there, the daughter of Billy Graham. When you pray, remember that appealing to the highest authority there is. Nobody can go over his head. He is the highest authority we can appeal to. What he says is so. While we deserve judgment, we ask for grace and mercy. President Trump took part in this event yesterday, sending a message from the White House to be read. And here is, and there's a lot more to this. You could probably look it up. Uh, but he did state this. On this inaugural National Day of Prayer and Return, the First Lady and I join millions of Christians here in the United States and around the world in prayer as we turn our hearts to our Lord and Savior. The President spoke of the nation's Christian heritage by saying this, Following in our ancestors' footsteps, we continue the firm reliance on the protection of divine providence that that provides us enduring strength and reassurance in our times of need. Paul tells Timothy, fierce times, perilous times, difficult times. You heard 19 things today on what it's going to be like, which gives us 19 things to be different from. Would our team of worshipers come as we conclude today? He tells us the kind of people that we are to become. I am grateful for Christian leaders who organize a day of prayer, who call people together, who lead in prayer and repentance. If you remember when Jesus came the first time, The prophets foretold, and God rose up, a leader who would prepare the way for Jesus. In the scripture, his name was John. John was the one to prepare the way for the Lord's coming. And he prepared the way for the Lord's coming by preaching, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of God. Jesus is coming soon for the second time. The word for the hour would be similar to the word of John in that day. The church needs to live in repentance to prepare the way for our Lord. And so each and every day as the Spirit of God speaks to us, and a couple of weeks ago, I spoke this as well. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run the race with perseverance. Today is a day, church, we need to stay focused, not to get distracted by the things of this world. This is a day to unload some of those things that are a weight to us that are keeping us from serving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is a day to have spiritual input on a daily basis to feed our spirit that inside the spirit of God is strong within us. If we don't do that, we're not going to make it. Fearful times, fierce times, grievous times. He's told us ahead of time. So he's told us ahead of time, so we have time to be strong. We have time to exercise our faith. We have time to let the light of Jesus Christ be lighter in our life. And so that's where we should be. Again, preaching of the word brings a great challenge to our life. Would you stand with me today? If there's any weights upon you today and you say, I need to lay this down, then right now as we pray, I'm going to ask you to do that. If there's any sin and compromise in your life, I'm going to ask you to bring that before the Lord and cry out for His help. To repent and cry out for the help of the Lord. But today, use this opportunity right now to look to the Lord. Lord, fill me to overflowing. 
Come on, right now, right now. Lord, fill me to overflowing. Let the Word of God be alive in my life. Let my pursuit be you, O Lord. Let my pursuit be you. Those things, and maybe even those people, uh, which have dragged me down. Now, obviously, I can't be talking about a spouse there or, or someone else like that that you're already bound to. Because sometimes a spouse that's not following the Lord can drag someone down. The Lord doesn't tell you to leave them as a result of that. But to those friends that, that they drag you down. They're not feeding you and, and you are struggling and you're already being overcome. At some point, you're going to have to make a choice. Are you really going to do this or not? Because if you don't make the choice and you keep failing, one of these times you're going to fail for the last time. God doesn't want that for you. His love for you is so amazing that he causes me to say this right now so that you can hear this, so that you can respond, so that you can be free, you can be empowered, and you can live in victory. If you want that today, I encourage you to pray and ask the Lord. Lord, I hand this over to you. Take it. I don't want this anymore. Make a decision. Make a decision. Cast off the weight and the sin. Run this race with perseverance. Let the light of Jesus shine in you. Because you're going to be effective for the Lord. And the light of God is going to shine through you in these days. Lord, I pray for that right now. For each and every one in this room. For those who are online, Lord, that are listening right now. Empower us, Lord, by your Spirit. Lord, let your Spirit overflow out of our life. And just like water would flow into a dirty glass, and the more the pure water flows, the cleaner that it gets inside. Let your spirit so flow, let your word so flow in our lives, Lord, that the more we take it in, the more it just pushes out the ugly. It pushes out the sinful. It pushes out the dirty. Lord, rain in our life. Can anyone say amen to that right now? Lord, rain in our life. Lord, let my life be lived for you. Let, let my life be lived to bring glory to your name. Lord, let people see the goodness of God in me. Let people see the goodness of God in me. Let me be a reflection of the contrast of the ninth thing, fierce, negative, perilous things. Let me be a contrast to that, Lord. Anyone here today, Lord, that says, I just need to repent and give my life to God. Jesus, come into my life right now. Save me. Forgive me. Come in and take control. Anyone that says that today, we agree with you right now that the Lord would do that. As you turn from a sinful life, turn to Christ. He receives you because of his great love and amazing grace. Father, bless him today with that. Just worship him. Just worship Him. Just worship Him. Just worship Him. Come on, church. Fill this place with worship. Fill this place with worship. Remember, worship and thanksgiving. Worship and thanksgiving. Bless your people, Lord. Bless your people, Lord. Bless your people, Lord. Bless your people, Lord.
That's it, Lord. Stir it up within us, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, ask him. Let this be a prayer. The hour from all night. Now let the captives free. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, let your glory That's our prayer today. Have your way with us. Let the Spirit of God be stirred up within us. Let us cast off the weights. Let us run this race with perseverance. And may we endure to the end and bring you glory. May we live to be a blessing to others. May we be, may we live to honor your holy name. Let our thoughts not be to ourselves, but on how we can be a blessing. How we can love you and worship you and honor you. And how we can be a blessing to others. Father, I ask you for that. Minister that to each one today, Lord. May we be empowered by your spirit to live for you and be strong. Strong in spirit, we pray. And for that, we give you thanks today, Lord. As we prepare now, Lord, to go and share fellowship together around the table and around a meal, we ask your blessing upon the food and a blessing upon that time. As your church chair shares together, Lord, let strengthening take place by relationships that are built around the dinner table. We give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our meal will be taking place in the youth chapel. So you could go out these doors or those doors and make your way over that way. We'd like everyone to stay. You're welcome to stay uh, for chili. There's sandwiches and stuff. Uh, God bless you today.